Okay, good morning to everybody. So we are on the home stretch. And next week we should be wrapping up our lectures and tutorials. And uh, as you know, this is week 10. You have a long Easter weekend. Friday is a holiday. Monday is a holiday. And then you know, once we're into April, by the 28th, your exams start. So, so really, if you just have about two weeks in terms of preparing for your exam. So I said next week we'll wrap up. So we begin our review today. And as I said before, how today is going to benefit you is that you come prepared to get involved in the activities we are going to be doing here and asking questions. Like, um, so this is not note taking. We had the whole semester where you took notes. But this is where it's going to be interactive. But to just come and take notes, you're really defeating yourself. This is a session for us to have, as I said, one big tutorial. It's going to be interactive. We're going to be asking questions. If you want to make note, you can make note of something that stands out. But surely to just write your deal notes, it means you're not paying attention. But this is for us to clarify and give understanding of areas and um, just go through a couple of the sample questions. This is the 2014 paper, right? Um, which is about three years ago. So the generated structure, the, the structure is a little different because in that year, we had um, two sections. There was a the financial ratio section used to be compulsory. Um, but in recent years, we haven't made it compulsory. Uh, so, so there are no compulsory sections in terms of the exam. Right? You just have to choose three questions, so there's no compulsory question. Um, so what I want to do now is to, for the next 15 or 20 minutes, just go through some of the critical areas that you need to cover, generic areas that you really need to cover in preparing for the exam, not necessarily the topics, but these are some critical areas you need to know, generically, right? Uh, and it's not to answer a question, but it's for you to be able to do your exam properly. So if you see the th what it's saying here, and this has been all papers, and I hope students would have read it and not just gone to the questions, because some past papers were up, it says this is a running case scenario. So it's not the traditional exam where you've got separate questions. It says it's a running case scenario. Please remember that the questions are linked even though they are numbered separately. And this is what it was saying from semester one. Right? So for students who just ignored what I said and were prepared for the old road exam, that you will come and just study and read questions and go in the exam and hope you pass, it is saying this is not your traditional exam. Right? But one of the reasons I hope the students would understand then is the reason why we gave you the quizzes and there's a reason why we gave you the cases. And I will tell you the reason why. The quizzes were intended to force you to read. Because I know a lot of students wait for the last minute to read. So the quizzes were simple quizzes to force you to read to test your understanding of the various topics. And so far, what you can see, most students have done exceptionally well. Right? Because the only way to do the quiz, you have to read or talk to your colleagues, or go in the exam and hit or miss. So let me guess these. So my friend here. And tall girl, you, you didn't go and guess anything, right? Right. But people, in fact, the last quiz I saw, people did really well. A lot of people got 24, and so the 24, and 23, you know, 24, and 22. So when you calculate out of 10, those people will get nearly full marks, right? When you round it off. But anybody getting 24, 23, 22, they'll get nearly 10. Um, but people did generally well. So that's the reason, Charlie, why we did these things. Right? Now, if you went there and guess and just hit and miss, no, you cheated yourself. You didn't cheat me. You cheated yourself. Right? Second thing, the cases were designed for a particular reason. And that is for you to understand the exam because the exam is actually one case. That's what the exam is. The exam is a case. Right? And because it is a case, we gave you the opportunity to practice case analysis, and you realize you would have had to done all the basic stuff from EFE to IFE to CPM. Some people went ahead and did the grand strategy, right? And you would have done your ratio analysis, value chain analysis, competitive strategies. 
So when you look through this paper now, you realize that everything that was covered in those cases is what is going to be covered in your exam. So once you were involved in your group case, and once the group worked well together, and you saw it as a learning activity, so the groups, the students who, who treated the case presentation as an opportunity to kind of do your part and get the group mark, you keep to yourself. The smart students who saw it as an opportunity to learn where you and the group worked together, and the people presented and you met, and you discuss the various sections, you feel really good now, and you're really prepared for the exam, right? So the case wasn't just to give you marks, it was intended to prepare you for the exam, right? So, so let's look at the, well, before we get to the past paper, they said, there are a number of generic things that students going into the exam must know. And the first thing is the, the role and function of a pestle analysis, right? That is what it is, the pestle analysis, so if you think about the cases, we said there's some basic things we need to do before you analyze the case. So the pestle analysis, everybody should know the pestle analysis by now, the reason for pestle analysis. Right? You're not going to get an exam question. I said the things I'm mentioning are not what topics coming in the exam. These are things you need, you should know. Right? Uh, you should also know the role of vision, the role of omission. You should also know business model. What is a business model? What are the elements of a business model? So we discussed it throughout this, the class, but I realized there's still some students who are still struggling with the business model between bricks and mortar, brick and click and click. But you should know the concept of a business model because I'm sure in some question or the other, you're going to be required, you might use that as an example to argue your case. Right, so business model, the there are some theoretical perspectives we introduce you to, the industrial and organization perspective, and the RBV. These are two perspectives that the average student should know at this point. Right? So when we say RBV, when we say I.O., what do you mean? I.O. relates to, sorry? What about the external? It's not just external, what does it say? Excellent, Caroline. It says that with the I.O., an organization should largely focus on the external focus forces as a means of gaining its competitive advantage. And then we have the RBV, which says the opposite. You should focus more on your internal resources, and everybody should know from your internal assessments what the internal resources are, right? And how those internal resources are, anybody can tell me? Where in your exam does internal resources or knowledge of it, of them become important? Sorry? In the CPM and, sorry? In value chain, what else? In the space, some of them in the IFE, right? What else? There's one area that they are, all are relevant. What you mentioned, some might be relevant. Right? Those are tools of analysis. But what topic or what subject area they are likely to come in? Implementation, excellent. Right. So you, you list the tools of internal assessment, but in any question on implementation, you need to know all of these resources and how these resources interrelate, but particularly the human resource. So when we talk about the human resource, and we ask you to show the importance of the human resource in implementation, what kind of tools or theoretical perspectives can you use to argue your case? Sorry? Your RBV, excellent. That's very good. All of your competitive and corporate strategies, and according to the literature, when we say competitive strategies, we mean, we mean competitive strategies. The generic competitive strategies, what are we talking about? All lead to competitiveness. When we say the generic competitive strategies, 
but put them in it still. Okay. So when we say the generic competitive strategies, we are talking about your very correct portal, ABD, cost leadership, differentiation and focus strategies. You need to know those and then also, you also need to know all of the other corp what we call corporate strategies that will help you to begin gain competitiveness. They all lead to that, but for this is called the generic competitive strategies. So you need to know all of those. Right? Integration strategies, the intensive strategies, diversification strategies, differentiation strategies, the defensive strategies, the aggressive strategies. You need to know all of those and need all of those very well, right? You can't miss out any. And why can't you miss out any of those strategies? Can somebody tell me? Sorry? Why must you know all of these strategies? Yes. But why in the exam you need to know all? Which recommendations? No, but it's more specific. If or when you get a question on a class strategy or space, you need to know all, or you don't know what quarter you're going in. And you will get a question on one of those. But you don't know which is coming, so you need to know all. Since you don't know which quarter is going to come in, you need to know all of your competitive and your corporate strategies. But again, once you did your cases well and you participated, you know all of these strategies and how they work. Um, the five forces analysis, you're not going to get any question on five forces analysis, but I'm sure you know, somebody give you an example of how you will be required to utilize five forces analysis. All right, if you're analyzing value chain or analyzing how the company might want to manage its costs, you might need to speak about the five forces. And why? What part of the five forces you want to speak to? Somebody give me an example. Sorry? Yes, Chad? And how is that important, Chad? And why you might want to do that, Chad? <laughs> right. Right. So, so because if the cost of supplies are too expensive, as Chad said, it can impact on the cost of production, which eventually will impact on on the price you are able to offer your customers. Right. Um, so, folks, you see this simple discussion. I told you those who did the cases and argued them well. The exam is just you individually pitching your case presentations. And all the exam is you in the exam by yourself, basically doing what you had to present in the case by different people. Right? And as I said, the exam will be one of those cases that I would have broken down into different sections. One of the same cases you had, they will have a whole set of cases. So I just took one of those cases. And instead of you doing all the part of working at it to do the IFP and CPM and thing, I just would have taken out and given you those that you would see here. So it's just you in the exam doing the case on your own. Right? So that's why I told you in preparing your cases, don't just do your part and don't be interested in the others, you see. That's the reason, the reason why I did it in that particular way. Right? And then the other issue with that, the financial ratio, as I told you already, you're going to get a question on that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then cost management, I prefer to say the importance of an organization managing costs. And the value chain is one of those tools, or one of the most critical tools, to help an organization manage its costs. You understand what I'm saying here, folks? So I'm saying the most important issue is how does a company manage costs? So don't forget the value chain is only a tool to help manage costs. It's just a tool to help manage costs. But the most important thing is cost management, and not just value chain management. 
You understand? So if a team of executive directors or managers are meeting, they will start the meeting by saying, okay, let's have a meeting about the value chain. Let's look at the value chain. Do you understand? They will start the meeting by saying, let's look at cost management. What are the issues of cost in the company? How can we go better managing costs? Because why would a company want to better manage costs? Alexander, Mr. Matthew, Mr. Dean, how would a, why would a company want to go about managing costs? Sorry? It affects the profits. So bottom line, the company want to keep its costs to a minimum because it wants to improve its profitability. So remember that saying, your role in the exam, in fact, let me show you your role in the exam. You have been hired as a strategy consultant. <laughs> the first question. Second one, as consultant for Hersey. Third question, as consultant for Hersey, grand strategy matrix. Fourth question, as consultant for Hersey. Fifth question, as a strategic management consultant. Corporate social responsibility, this is the most generic ones. Final question, illustrate the challenges, your client's business. So folks, in the exam, you are a consultant. You understand? So you're not writing theoretical and academic essays, like you can just read the text. Your head is, I am a consultant, I am advising my client. So as you write your essays, or you write your reports, so at least a lot of them are more reports than they are traditional essays, you see? Um, so as you write your reports, you are going to be speaking to your client. Right, you see, prepare a detailed report. It doesn't say prepare an essay, prepare a detailed report. So when you do your reports to your client, you need to be mindful that you are the consultant. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Right? So it's not a traditional type of essay questions that you would get. That's why we spend so much time in classes and the interaction. And that's why I said to you, you could go in the exam with the textbook and still fail because the textbook just will not give you the answers. It is your role as consultant and different students will look at different things to analyze, etc. So those are the critical foundation concepts that I mentioned that all students going into the exam must know. So they say, so it is about cost management and in looking at how a company goes about to manage its costs in different ways, you then look at value chain analysis, but there are also other things you might need to look at. As Chad said, maybe the power of suppliers, power of the distributors, bargaining power of the, of the customers, right? Um, or you might look at financial ratios to determine how is this company doing? You know, is this company managing, does it have a lot of debt? But if the company has a lot of debt, that also impacts on its ability, it's part of its cost, expenses, right? So that's the interlinkages that we spoke about, that the various questions are linked, and that's the way you would do best. Um, remember the questions are linked and they're integrated in one form or another. So what I want to do now is to go through the, well, I think we went through racial analysis. I don't necessarily want to go through this. I think we did that last time we went through the paper. So just remember, folks, you have to look at all the categories. When you're looking at the financial ratio question, you're looking at categories. So you're looking at its sales and net income. You're looking at its price earnings ratio, and I'll touch on that a bit. You're looking at its profit margin versus its net profit margin, gross profit versus net profit, and you're comparing the industry with the company. And then you're looking at its debt to equity, the liquidity ratio, you're looking at its debt to equity ratio, current quick ratio, and the book value per share. So anybody, can somebody tell me how does earnings per share differ from price earnings ratio? How many earnings per share differ from price earnings ratio? Earnings per share is. I can't hear you. It is the. It is what the. What the investors get per share? Right. So is the better shareholder invest in the company? 
earnings per share is what the shareholders would get at the end of the year based on what? Based on profit, the company would have its profit targets, and once the company meets its profit targets, they will pay. So what is what, are, what is um, price earnings ratio? What is their price earnings ratio? What is my name? Price earnings ratio. Who are the accountants here? Who are the accountants putting your hand up? Finance people. I get it, Dr. Robinson, for y'all, you know. I'm just trying to see if it's a bit low. Anybody here have an IT background? Anybody wants the price earnings ratio? Who is interested in a price earnings ratio? She's generally correct, but the price earnings, they are actually looking for future benefits. So they might pay a particular premium in this current period with the anticipation that this company will end the growth more and that its profitability will increase. So they, they might make a premium payment for shares now. But the kind of returns they will get in the future are so substantial that they're prepared to pay a premium. That's what the price earnings is. They are correct. It's what investors, so it's people who want multi millions of dollars who will be interested, that they will make these premium purchases now with the view that in future, so the earnings per share is for the person who just would invest shares with lower risk. But the big investors who would invest big dollars will pay a premium, but in future, the kind of payback we will get in the future. The more that I'll pay the premium price we are paying the shares, you see. Uh, but you're generally correct, it's really um, of interest to the investors. So I would suggest you spend some time looking at the ratios we have here. Spend some time looking at your sales ratios, net income, looking at your price earnings ratio. Also look at your gross profit versus net profit margin. Why might you be interested in gross profit versus net profit? Somebody who hasn't spoken. Where are you interested in gross profit versus net profit? Right. So it tells you the extent to which, so it tells you whether a company, right, not profitable, no. It tells you whether the company is. I'm not covering this. Which ratio tell you they cover they can cover the expenses? The equity that is covering its expenses. The current ratio and quick ratio. Right. The current ratio for the tell they're covering the short term obligations. But when you look at growth and net profit, what is the major thing that is telling you there when you look at growth and net profit? Okay, the extent to which the company is managing its costs overall. So don't forget everything that we dump in there then, right? So it tells you the extent to which the company is managing its, its range of costs, right? Which could be your, whatever expenses, your variable costs, your fixed costs, your taxation, whatever interest earns. So, you're trying, so it's trying to distinguish is this company managing costs? And if you realize that when it's compared to the industry, the industry has a better net profit margin. What kind of recommendation might you make to the company? You realize that when, it look, when you look at the net profit margin for company Hersey, that the industry actually has, right? A way that assume the industry has a 15, right? Suppose the industry is 15.5. 
What recommendations might we make to her to see? Sorry? That somebody. Excellent. Why? Yes. So what kind of specific actions you can recommend they take? Because she says strategic cost analysis, so the company might be able to monitor its unit by unit cost. So what kind of recommendation you can make for the company after you do that copy cost? What are you trying to do when you look at the cost, the cost analysis? Right. So what kind of things could result when you do this copy unit? What kind of things you would find? But before that, when you do the unit by unit analysis, it helps the company identify its cost advantage, right? It cost advantages. It's cost disadvantages and it's cost drivery. You understand, right? But you're on the ball. But those are the things that we're looking for. You understand? Because you don't want to do strategic cost analysis in itself. It is done for a reason. And the reason is when I do the unit by unit analysis with my main competitors, I can then determine what they have an advantage on being cost here. Or I have an advantage over cost with them. But if your advantage is too much bigger than mine, I need to take action, which but it depends on where my costs are. So where can some the cost disadvantages be? Huh? So the salaries which would be in your which would be but where is that? In your secondary or support value chain, or it might be in your in your raw materials, which would be in your Primary value chain. So what actually have you realized is your raw material source is the problem? I want to recommend market integration. And what would help you to support you that this is the right thing to do? And what do you call it then? She said if you have few suppliers, which means that you have the bargaining power of the supplier. But folks, this is all you did in your cases, and we all realize what we're talking here is what you did in your case presentation. This is what you argued, you know. You see French feedback from an environment, and you identify the company's weaknesses, you identified its strengths, you did value chain analysis, you said that it, needs to, it was a problem of supplier bargaining power. You, you went through, folks, oh, this is what you did in your case presentations. And then you gave a set of recommendations. You analyze financial ratios, you analyze value chain, you analyze IFP, you analyze CPFs. I'm saying to you folks, the cases you did is just your exam in tutorials. Just you will have a different question. Anybody got any other questions on the financial ratio or can we move on? Can we move on? Any questions on this? So when we look at the current ratio, quick ratio for her C, what did I tell you? My friend made a ratio. When you look at this current ratio, quick ratio for her C and the industry, what did they tell you? Sorry? That the company is able to pay back its, not its liabilities, short term liabilities. So folks, in the context of the exam, these little distinctions are critical to mark, you know. For the current and ratio, only be in your short-term obligations and liabilities. So if you just say it to pay back its liabilities, I will put, as you might get a mark for that, I will question mark, which liabilities, short or long. So you've given away marks easily. So don't, so don't, be, don't assume that I know what you mean. You need to be very clear because it's short term. You understand what I'm saying, folks? These are the little things cause you marks. And you know it, but you just made a general, don't make, in other words, don't make generalized comments, be specific. When you're talking about the exam, you understand what I'm saying? So when you look at the quick ratio for the industry and the company, what is it telling you? That they're not. They are equivalent. How do we interpret this? Sorry? So what it tells you when you compare it currency the industry? So what does it tell you then? 
He's correct. Folks, if, if I had an industry average is on it, it means that in this particular industry, it generally carry low corporate riches. So it means that the, the industry inventory factor is not a big issue when you look at the industry. But if it was other businesses, the supposed big manufacturing companies, you could argue another thing that maybe is because the manufacturing is a lot of a lot of big inventory stocking up stuff. So you might argue it's either the industry is in trouble. Right? Because generally once you get below 1.8, 0.7, it means you're gonna be having trouble recovering that. But you know again from your finance, you don't just look at things in isolation. So it might be that the industry just carries a low um quick ratio. And so that's the conclusion you could draw. Based on the fact that the industry is also on it, so it's saying per C is comparable to the industry, which means it's an industry condition, so they're not disadvantaged. You point your say here together, your colleague was saying per C is not a disadvantage when you compare the current ratio and you check out the inventory that it goes to point eight. Right? So use the industry as a benchmark for you to determine how is this company meeting the industry standard. But if you just concluded, per C is 0.8, which means that you cannot cover its short term obligation and it's a problem, you have to put a caveat because the industry is also 0.8, which means that the average business in this industry is carrying a similar inventory. So maybe it's some condition of the industry. Maybe because of the nature of it, it's a high, there's a very high um, areas of big investment, some high cost structure in terms of the inventory, right? That, um, that causes them to have a challenge with maybe their cash or cash flow. It could be an industry condition, but the case does not give you enough information to know specifically why they're carrying a short thing. But under exam conditions, if you get a question like this, you don't get in there battling too long. The main thing I suggest you do in the absence of information is to just do what your colleagues say, look, yes, by the standard, the point A generically will be considered a low quick ratio, but the fact that per C is comparable to the industry suggests that this industry carries a low quick ratio and to note per C is comparable to the industry, right? Which means that if it was an outlier, if it was a point six, you could understand it's really below the industry. But that's the best way to do it instead of trying to argue a case and hope enough evidence to show why is it that the industry is carrying a low inventory. So when you look at the profitability, what is it telling us about Percy? What is it telling us about Percy? Hmm? When you look at its profitability, But if you have to, if I say how are you how would you assess its profitability? How would you approach that? Right, go ahead. How? Say we look at it against the industry. How? How do you assess the profitability of RT against the industry in this fashion? Yes? You said they have a good net profit margin? Sorry? You're asking them? It's 7 point, RT is 7.4 for the net profit margin, industry 5.5. And then for the five year net profit average, her C is 8.9 and the industry 7. So, how do you analyze it or interpret it? Right. But, you, but is something missing? Anybody can see what is missing? You're saying it is more profitable than the industry. But that's general, the whole, go ahead. Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you run a 
Is my uh, it's more profit than we on because we are average against the business we have as well as probably their profit or how many you on our profit. That's the point. There are two levels of profitability. There's one the current year and then the five year average. So when you say it is more profitable, that's general. But the children that will get more marks is the children that recommend. So anybody say it's more profitable, you're correct. But the student that goes on, as he said, to say, but don't forget two levels of profitability is talking about. One, the current year, which is the point, the 7.4 versus 5.5, and then the five year average, which is the 8.9 versus 7. So he's saying you should look at the difference between the two. So it is basically suggesting, as he said, that in the current, Percy seems to be even more, becoming more profitable than the industry. Which is a good thing. But if you're even saying on average, suppose you see what I'm saying? So the first one that is more profitable, you will get marks. But the student that gets additional marks will be the student that recognizes there are really two issues of profitability here. The current and the five year average, which establishes per C seems to have been outperforming the industry for the last five years. But even in the current year, it is even doing better than the industry, which means it's doing some good things. Yes. Hold, hold a bit, hold a bit. I can't see. I can't hear you. I think we can bring all the time tomorrow. Of course, let's see what this Don't forget, you know, there are a lot of working people that can't come to the morning class. Huh? So I'm trying to record it that they can hear it. But the problem they are having sometimes they don't hear your interaction. So I want that the students that are working cannot come. You know the working women have brought two, three children that really can't work. It, it? <laughs> so you have them all. Now, when we, so when we put it recording, at least working with the right, yes. But well, you've got a good boss, right? But you've got a lot of people that are getting a lot of bosses when they give you time, right? So we just want them to be able to hear the dialogue that can benefit them. That's an interesting, but you don't know that. I mean, you can have a market crash. I think, and it's a good point she's mentioning, whether you could argue that in other words, it's a good investment you can make. So I think from the point of view, maybe the point of price earnings ratio, it might suggest that this company, based on the management of its resources and its profitability, might be more attractive to investors because of its profitability. Right? So you can argue more people might want to invest in it to benefit long term, maybe as shareholders, because of this growth in profitability. So that's a good way you can put it, right? Um, so, the other, so folks, what other things can we say here when we look at the profitability of the company? What other things can you say to support your answer about its profitability? Because there are a number of, of assumptions that can be made. Yes. Right, you can, you can start. Yeah. Yes, you can say that. It might have marked share. Major player. It's very profitable. Yes. Of course. Excellent. That's an excellent observation, too. Right, which means that, excellent. And then you could all, right, so you can say that it seems they're managing their costs very well, which suggests they might be doing really good value chain analysis. They might be looking to improve their operational costs, manage their variable costs. They might have been dealing with issues. So you could talk about the things you hope is not an answer. So some students might say it suggests they might be finding ways, for example, of improving its cost of distribution. They might have taken control of the distribution network. Some students might say they might have outsourced some of the primary, uh, the primary functions. Some people might argue it might also suggest that the company might have, it could have engaged in some point some relationship with the supplier to get cheaper sources of supply. It might have properly degraded it. it might have, as some students said in the presentations we speak, they might have gone in. In fact, if I tell you that, if you're, you're smart, 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 you
a smart should know say if you go to I will say after the thing. Now, the thing about the price earnings, folks, a, com a number of companies are very complex. And even when you see the investment video ratio, they say that you really can't look at ratios in isolation. Huh? It's a very complex thing. Huh? But for example, because a company is profitable, doesn't mean that the shareholders will get money all the time. Because what happens at the annual journal meeting, the company makes a determination that based on levels of profitability, shareholders will get X. It's just a profit board. So a company will determine we want to convince the shareholders to reinvest money in the company. So the company might, even though they're profitable, they might be on a big, massive expansion program. So even though they're profitable, the shareholders know that for the next five years, it's going to be a big investment. They will be getting big loans. So hence, they will need cash to pay the loans. Right? So just because there's big profits doesn't mean the shareholders are going to get a lot of money. But the company board of directors and the annual journal meeting to determine how much dividends will be paid based on whatever profit targets that are reached. So if somebody has set up a high profit target, that is only when you reach X percent profit target, you will then pay shares. Another company may have a lower threshold of profitability to pay dividends to its shareholders. Right? So that's why you will see variations in the price earnings ratio. It is up to the company to determine when and how are we going. Some people, some companies say, look, because we have major investments and loans, you know, um, they, and they're going to be having challenges, they declare, you know, that they're not going to be big to claim any very AGM, or the AGM that would be. And they said, look, you know, they're not going to be declaring any shares this year. You're going to reinvest and you're, you're trying to go to your AGM. And you put the vote to the AGM and they agree, you know, we wouldn't pay this year, we got a major expansion and investment, we want to reinvest the money in the company. You know, there are a lot of competitors coming on stream. So there are a whole set of complicated issues that would have to be considered in terms of paying share shareholder money. So the IFE, I got grants, so this should be IFE, sorry. This should be a grant strategy. This is the IFE. So here it says, as the consultant, right, as the consultant for Hersey A, you have been asked to critique the following IFE, internal faculty evaluation matrix, and based on the issues discussed, critique and prepare a detailed report which proposes the most effective competitive strategies the company should pursue. Remember, folks, they say prepare a report, not prepare an essay. It's a report, all right, which puts it in a different context. So by now, everybody should know how to do an IFE, right? And everybody should know the principles of any matrix like this, IFE, CPM, EFE. So when we are analyzing this EFE, what stands out for you? What stands out for you in the strengths? The highly ranked, and why are you focusing on number four, the highly ranked overall quality? Why are you focusing on number four? She's saying because it has a weight of 0.09, what else should you want to look at? You're also looking at five because experienced management team has a weight of one, which suggests the two of these are the most important critical success factors. I would suggest, and obviously there are constraints of time in the exam. The three I would suggest you could focus on would be the one, nine, and eight. Right? The one, point zero nine, point zero eight, and the three of those. The one. 0 0.09, 0 0.08, which will be the three highest ones, right? So average no more than three. If you try to do too much, you'll run out of time, right? But three is enough to give me an idea that you understand what is happening. And so what it tells you about number five, somebody analyze that for me quickly. Number five is saying, Ms. Rhea, 
the best lady. What does that tell you? Number five, quickly. Experience management team. Sorry? It's one. It's not really. Don't ring in the back. There's ladies in the back here. That the company has. Sorry? Right, she's saying it suggests that the company has invested in its human resources, its management team. So what else would you tell us about that play? What's happening there? It is a major strength because there is a four rating. And when we look at number four, highly ranked in overall quality, it is also a major strength. And then we look at the weaknesses. What do the weaknesses tell you? What, do the, what are the two most important? The higher losses in 20, 2008 by 400% and three much higher current debt against current assets by 124. So it's saying higher losses in 2000 in a particular year that it has significant losses. So maybe if we spur in profits, they might have gone through a very serious program to pull down costs to get back in profitability. But then one of those years is the same, it had a, a major issue. Um, but this is this is not for Hersey though, this is a different company. Right? I pushed this in here. This IFT is not for the same company. I couldn't find one, the IFT for the company. So this is one that I put in from a, a different company. Everyone understand what I'm saying? This IFT is not for her seat. This is for a different company that I put in so we can practice looking at the IFT. Why is that important? Why can't be her seat? My friend here, the person here, what's her name? Huh? You're real number two. Yes, real. Why can't be the same her seat? Why can't it be her seat? Right, because we were just talking about how profitable it is, and then we're talking about losses in 2008. Right, they can't be hearsay. So how come the body didn't tell you that they take it up? <laughs> You're not yet. <laughs> right, but it's not true. So I want, I, but there's a reason why I'm practicing IRT. I say no more. <laughs> So for higher losses in 2008, what does it tell you about the company? What does it tell you? Hmm? But in terms of analysis, what does it tell you? Right. But, but don't forget, for you look at the EFT, what does it tell you? Sorry? Me? But no, no. We are number four. What does it tell you? Four is a one. You want to give me the rating yet, you know? You first need to say how oh, it is rated. When you deal with your rating, you can then go on to talk about all the things you're trying to say. But the first thing you need to do is to analyze the IFU. It says it had a major loss, which is rated as a major weakness. Right? Versus if it was a minor weakness. Because the industry could have had losses of a thousand percent. You understand? So before the industry benchmark, you can't assume it is bad. As you said, it could be the industry going through radical changes. So all the businesses, all the airlines could be losing money. But first in the case, it's a major weakness. Also, the second one, higher current debt, also a major weakness. This suggests they're going through, uh, through some very serious financial challenges. And then number seven, what does number seven tell you? Would you focus on number seven? Why not? 
of it of 0 0.03, which means yes, the operating cost issue, but the operating costs are not a major problem for this company. So is there anything the case the lowest? You understand is from the company's perspective, it's the less important weakness. So you don't focus on the thing that is less important. So what they're saying is not really that important. These other things are much more important than the overall operating costs, you see. So if you go into this area and focus on number seven, and you write two pages on it, I would just put a question mark, why? You know, like, you have 0 0.09, 0 0.09, 0 0.08, 0 0.08, 0 0.06, 0 0.05. 0 why would you choose the, 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 the biggest that is really not of significance to the company? Very low in terms of inflation, you see. So you would have spent two pages arguing for something that's really nothing. So you would need to justify why you spent so much time on something that's not important to the company, which is very hard to do. So, right? so you've got to be able to know those little things when you're doing your analysis. And then the overall weighting. So in terms of recommendations, what recommendations would you make to this company if you had to assess or advise it? And you're the consultant, you're going to see in this IFP, what recommendations could you make to the company? What kinds of things could you recommend? Why? Right, correct. So you can, and then all the other issues we talked about with bad, and that's really the questions that are going to be linked, <clears throat> you see? So obviously if it is having high losses, you need to find out where are the major areas of loss, and that's where you look at a comprehensive assessment of your value chain to find out where these cost drivers are, and that's the language you're looking for. The cost drivers, the cost advantages, cost disadvantages, strategic cost analysis. But that's what we're looking for to show that you understand the language, you see, and that you can use it as a consultant. So you're very correct. Um, what about for number three? What kind of recommendations could you make for number three? Much higher current debt against current assets by 124 million. What recommendations could you make there? Much higher current debt against current assets by 124 million. Divest. All right, but before you get to that point, what kind of thing might you need to do before you get to that point? You can look at your financial ratios, you can look at the value chain, you can look at your cost structure. So if the units that you're, so if in your cost analysis you realize it's a particular business unit that had areas that were big cost drivers, and about 40 to 50 percent of your debt or cost was for one unit, you can then shut by see how to provide the rationale then if you're pro proposing divestiture or liquidation, but liquidation is just the whole thing. But let's say divestiture, you just need to bring a justification, which will still have to be you identify that there was a particular unit that was actually the main source of the cost drivers um, and gave you a significant cost disadvantage. So folks, all I'm looking for is for you to bring a logical set of arguments and rational arguments proposing. You're not telling the company how to solve the problem, but it's up to the company, but you're recommending to the company these are some things that you might consider doing. And I'm more interested in you showing me you understand the tools and the techniques and the languages that you can propose to your client. That's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the answer. I'm looking for your ability to reason and analyze and look at the various options available um, to the company. There's something else you can do. What else could you do? Restructure the debt. Debt restructuring. Go to your financial institution or look for another financial institution and say, look, I want to restructure my debt. Could you buy over my debt, give me a longer term? spread it over a longer time period. You can restructure your debt. So the finance students in here, that is something that will think that you should be mindful of.
So let's look at the grand strategy. Same, we went through this before. As consultant to Hersey, you'll be asked to critique the following grand strategy matrix. 10 marks based on issues discussed in the critique. Prepare a detailed report which proposes the most effective competitive strategy the company should pursue. So folks, I want to reiterate, I said it before I repeat it, the problem I had in the past is when you had questions like these, that says it is A is 10 marks, and B mark you, 10 marks, students write one essay. No A, no B. But it provides a difficulty for me to mark it. Because when you mix up everything in one, I don't know who to mark A or who to mark B. But I still find you hit the market, but it makes it very difficult and challenging for me because you technically have not answered the question. So I'm saying, once you see a question that has A and a mark, and B and a mark, answer A and then answer B. All right, please, it makes it easier on me, um, much more easier from a marketing perspective. So, a critique, you are the consultant. How would you go about critiquing this? First thing you will do, first thing you will do, you look at the axes. And you then determine you have your x axis and y axis, and we know her C is positioned by the point of the arrow. And then what do you do? How do you go ahead analyzing this? How do you go about analyzing the matrix? Is it just not rapid market growth? It has a it has a low growth in the second market. You sure it's so? Yeah, because it's not a near win. Important point. Chad, would you say it's low? Would you say it's low? Right now, folks, the key thing about this is the point of zero. Right? You understand? The point of zero. So just follow your number line. Anything above zero is positive. So if this is zero, anything above zero is positive, anything below zero, but it says slow market growth, high market growth. So the best thing to say is that the lower end of market growth, the lower end of rapid market growth, but not low market growth, but if it was low market growth, it would have to fall below zero. Well, this is slow market growth. You understand? So is that the, low, the right language would be is that the lower end of rapid market growth. You understand? The lower end of rapid market growth. But is it still market growth? Yes. That's why it is above zero. So it is still a positive. And the company is competitive and it gives you a set of options. So every student should know then. What things should fall within the quadrant? Correct? So you know the intensive strategies, the integration strategies would all fall within there. Well, concentric diversification. So folks, in an exam, you cannot mention all. Well, not mention, sorry. In an exam, you cannot analyze all or recommend all you 
people who want to come. But you have to mention all that will fall within the quadrant in the analysis or the critique. You have to mention all to show the examiner that if in whatever matrix you get, but a space also, you need to indicate all of the possible, that's where the critique comes. If six the company falls within quadrant one, you need to indicate all of the possible strategies and competitive or corporate strategies available to the company. And then you just recommend a few, right? Some students write real fast, but if you know you don't write fast, don't choose too many, yes. Is the well, you tell me. What do you think? You know, what if we said we asked but we said for all of the matrices we looked at brand strategy and X, there's always internal factors and external factors, correct? So which one, she's asking whether rapid market growth relates to the company or the industry? It's the industry, right? It's an industry factor. Which is the internal factor? The competitive position. So the competitive position is that what the CPM will say, this company is competitive or not. So the company assessing its own competitiveness. And then market growth is the external factor, right? Out of control for the, for the company. So is it in the particular market in growth or in the particular market in decline? And a good chart for this, if you want to include would be the product or industry life cycle. You know, there's growth, then it matures, and then it declines. And all markets at some point will decline. Right? But it's an external factor. No, it's the market, not the company. Right? It's the market. So that's the external factor. What you determine as the recommendation, it recommends all, right? So, but your job is to just determine whichever one you recommend, you just need to justify it. Right? Yes, you look puzzled. So, the No, no. Don't forget, what is compared? Your company is competing in a market. Right. So your company is competing in a market. Is this market providing opportunities or is the market not providing opportunities? So if the market is not providing opportunities, folks, even what is gonna happen here, the market is declining but you're the most competitive. But it's still declining, what do you do? You understand what I'm saying? So if the market is in decline, you don't have control over that. The market is in decline, that's an external factor. You have to respond to it. So remember, you respond to the external factors and you take control of the internal factors. So this is, if the market is changing, how do you respond? So it is saying here, you are in a growth market and your company is highly competitive. So the question is, what advantages can you take of this market growth? You understand what I'm saying? You are responding to the market. So if you are in a strong competitive position, how can you capitalize on or take advantage of the opportunities? And that's why I suggested different strategies. Your task will be to determine, but if my company is strong competitively, what are the best actions for me to take in a market that is in growth? You know the growth is at the lower end of the mark of the of the um, growth growth curve. So what do I think would be the best action for me to take? Yes, Jack. The horizontal. Could be could be a number of things. Stud different students would choose different things. You see. And the right, product development could be a range of things, but each student might choose different things, you just need to defend it. 
And that's all they want you to be able to do. Bring arguments as to why. If you say market, if you say horizontal integration chart, you just need to show why are you proposing it in this particular market situation. Right? And that's when you need to bring your knowledge of strategy to show why. You remember, you, don't have, you, don't, you can't get a 10-page or 15-page case in the exam. So that's where you need to make some assumptions and then reason theoretically. You're making theoretical arguments and logical arguments because you won't have a lot of facts in here to be able to do what you do. So are those theoretical arguments that I'm looking at that you're bringing to the table to show me, yes, I understand how this, how, how it works? Yes. Sorry? The question is how many, that's up to you folks. Some students write a lot and quickly. I've seen students in the exam write about eight pages per question. <laughs> yes. Some students write seven and eight per question in two hours. And write real well too. You'll be amazed. And write real well. Be clear, clear, clear. And not big, big, big. You'll be amazed. Some students can write very fast and very well and a lot in exams. So I say students are different, you see. You know your capability. You know how fast you write. But folks, the point is, you know, if you don't practice writing, if you never practice writing quickly under exam conditions, you, when you get the exam, you're going to be struggling. One of the things I used to do when I was an undergrad student, for all of my exams, I would take the tutorial questions, even in accounts, and I would go in the library, and I would assume I'm in the exam. I have two hours, and I go through the whole paper, timing myself. I would repeat that regularly, just practice under exam conditions. I would give myself like seven questions, and, and I time myself the ability to write as quickly as possible and respond to the tutorial. And I go back and do over like in accounting and econ. Go over the tutorial. I practice myself under exam conditions. And I just begin writing as much as I can. So if I practice with my speed. So it's, um, you see, speed writing is practice. If you don't practice it, so you go to the exam for the first time and never really practice. You see the point I'm making? So practice it for just take one and more past paper. And just, you're in that looking about just perfectly accurate. You're trying to develop your speed. So you're trying to read the question, interpret the question, and write, write the question and practice that over and over to develop your speed. Because speed is an issue in the exam. But if you don't practice it, if you wait to the exam to come to practice writing fast, you will struggle. So you could go and practice, but I told you. <laughs> yes. What is the company position? If you, if you want to. If you want to. Any other questions, folks? Any other questions? Yes, please. Say right. <laughs> if one of them will come. A grand strategy or a space will come. You will get one of them. Sorry? To go through the space. Alright, so what I'll do next week, I'll go through this. In fact, the space is here, right? Yes. So let's go through the space. Sorry? No, we went through this in detail. I mean, you weren't here. We went through this in detail one morning. You weren't here. That's weeks ago. We went through the space. And you say we didn't go through this? We went through the space. Sorry? You found something you went through the space? What's up?
What's up? You said you got recording? You don't see my recording? You don't see my recording that morning? But we didn't do this there. You can remember? Yeah. Yeah. But the, the space is the same thing. It's the same structure, actually. It's the same structure. And the only thing different is the, um, the quadrants. The only thing different is the quadrants. It's the same clothes, it's just the quadrants are different. The quadrants are different, that's all it is. But it's the same approach. That in the aggressive quadrant, either conservative, defensive, or competitive, strategies are recommended. The same thing. So if you are in the aggressive, it poses a whole set of competitive strategies or corporate strategies. If you're in conservative, it poses a set of strategies. If you're in the competitive, it proposes a set or defensive. It proposes it's the same structure. The only thing is, it is the axes are different. So this looks at the financial stability or financial position. It looks at the industry position, the environmental stability and competitive position. So it covers some of the same factors actually that you would find in, in the um, in the grant strategy, right? So financial would be internal, competitive would be internal, and environmental stability, external, and industry position, external. So the, so the industry stability, the market stability, is this particular market or industry stable, right? Um, the same thing you're looking at, is it strong, is it declining? Are there, you know, a lot of, is there a lot of turmoil in this particular industry? Um, so, so if it falls in the aggressive, similar, the same thing you did for the ground strategy, you do for the, the space matrix. The only difference now would be, it just tells you the conditions for financial stability. So it says for financial position or stability, it gives you the rating. So it would say the return on investment is a two, the leveraging position, the liquidity position, the financial average is here. And then it tells you about the environment, the unemployment and related are all external things, the barriers to entry, competitive pressures, price elasticity of demand, and uh, the industry growth potential. So I said it's dealing with the same thing as this space because the grant strategy talks about the, the industry growth or the market growth, and this also talks about growth potential, the uh, ease of market entry, uh, then the competitive position, competitive stability, right? the market share, the company, customer loyalty, which are the kind of things you would find in the CPM, right? Market share for you see, these are the things you would find in the CPM. So you're finding market share for quality, competitive position. So if you read the notes, you will read it, it's not that easy. It's not that difficult, sorry. <laughs> what is the market? That's many point coordinates, right? Exactly. So it's saying there is a problem in the first place on the industry stability and the industry stability and the industry stability and the industry stability the quadrant it falls in is the most important. That is in the aggressive quadrant. And they say what is different to the grand strategy, it tells you the conditions for each of the axes. Right? So it looks at finance, it tells you for each of the things mentioned. Why they got that, what position they are. 
So it tells you what the financial stability is, why? So you can look here and see, right? And then it tells you about the competitive stability or position, why and the rating it got. Now what you need to know, the final thing would be this, how you were able to come up with the coordinates. So the coordinates are, this is the little difference in grand strategy. So the y-axis, because you know you have to be coordinates is the x and y put together. So for the x-axis, it is made up of the com competitive position and the industry position, the two of those together. And for the y-axis is the financial and the external added to come up with the y coordinate, right? So it is different in that whereas in the grand strategy, you remember the grand strategy has like a continuum from good to bad, right? So if you look at it, so you go from rapid market growth to slow market growth, or strong competitive position to weak competitive position. So you can look at these coordinates um, at face value. But for the grand strategy, because it is not a continuum from bad to worse, right? That on the positive X is industry, negative X is competitive stability. So that's why it is best to look at the coordinates of their total to give you where it falls and then in the analysis it would be better for you if you want to make a decision suppose you say it's in the aggressive and it recommend it can recommend market development or product development the best way to look at it will be determine okay let's look at the company financial stability it's a 3.8 on a scale say five or seven if it's a seven point scale let's say a seven point scale 3.8 okay return on investment Two, leverage, two, five, high, yes, working capital, five, cash flow, five. So you can then look to see how strong is this company financially, because this is where you're going to make a decision now, whether to go into market development or product development, because if it is weak financially, you're talking about market development now, you don't have the resources to do it. And then you can look now at environmental stability. Is the environment stable? Is unemployment high? Because when you look at negative five, is it worst off or better off with unemployment? A zero five, is it worst off or better off? Worst off. So it means there's an unemployment problem. Is that good for businesses or bad for businesses? Why is it bad for businesses? It's bad for government. <laughs> this unemployment, folks. <laughs> you know your economics? Companies love high unemployment. <laughs> you can pay people at the lower end of the market. The, but that's from the buy and buy perspective, but from the point of view of if you want to hire staff. So the payoff would be, I can pay much lower wages if sales are not going to be as, as you see. So I can control my, my labor costs much better when I have a lot of people to choose from. So the higher unemployment, companies love that. Because it shows that so a lot of people won't work, and when people realize unemployment is really high, whatever you tell them to help them to feed their families, they will take the job. The problem for the company is when unemployment is very low and you need skills that are not available, is when you have a problem then, you see. From a government's perspective, that's an issue. Economic growth, you not have an economy turning around and people spending. Um, so, Competitive barriers, barriers to entry for, it seems like there might be some barriers, not a lot, but some barriers to entry. You see what I'm saying? So you can look at the competitive position again, market share, is that good for the company or bad? Sorry? Is it good or bad? Which is under the competitive, the company, that's the company's market share. Is that good or bad? Why bad? Folks, is it good or bad? Which, is, which has the higher value? The bigger negative number or the smaller negative number? The smaller negative number has the higher value. The smaller, the bigger the negative number, the less value it has. Right. 
So the smaller the negative number, the higher the value. Because it tends most to zero. You remember the number line, folks? It tends to zero, which means it's getting better. So the more the, big, the bigger the negative number, the less value it has. Negative 40, 50. No, 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 no. You remember, folks, the rating for the EFE? What is the four? What is the four? In the EFE, what is the four in terms of? No, not EFE, sorry. IFE. And a three? That's what we're saying, you see. So in the terms of the negative numbers, the negative two suggests that the company is better off because it goes to zero. So when the company is at negative two, it means it is doing well with its market share. Remember your number nine. <laughs> folks, folks, it is not a continuum. Don't forget, we have four items. One, two, three, four. So in this one, the bigger the negative number, the worse off. The short, smaller the negative number, the better off. When you read it, the text tells you that. The smaller the negative number, it is better off, but it's tending to zero. So once it tends to zero, it is better off. So it means once it is negative one, two, three, and four, the company seems to be doing well with its market share. If seven and eight means the negative number is becoming bigger, it has less value, so it's not doing as well. Right? But it's just the principles of the number line. Remember, we always get a lot of people get mixed up with it, you see? But just remember the IFE where we say, when it comes to the weaknesses, the bigger we say a major weakness is when it has this four, and a minor weakness when it has the three, following the same principle, right? Um, so, but the point we're making here, you will then look at these factors which have been determining the particular axis that we were speaking about. And that's what we give you the characteristic then. So that you can look to these and you make your decision then. So when I look at the customer loyalty, there's some there seems to be pretty good customer loyalty. Product quality seems to be good. So if product quality is good, would you recommend product development? Not necessarily. If my product quality is already good. So I'm not going to take money and put in something that I'm doing pretty well on. I would take my money to put in something that I'm not doing so well on, you see? So what we'll do next week, we will wrap up looking at CSR, implementation, and value chain. And that's it. And that will be the preparation for your exam. And folks, what I will say to you, ladies and gentlemen, Give me a minute, give me a minute.